The ancient people did not believe that men could own the land. In their view, man belongs to the earth. The telling of this story begins about 170 years ago on land between the Guadalupe and La Vaca rivers in what would become the Republic of Texas. In the early 1830s, pioneers with surnames like Brown, May, and Hickey left behind the country of Ireland and the states of Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri to try to build a better life. At the time, colonists from the United States were not welcome. That didn't stop these pioneers. A couple of years later, the Alamo would fall, but the Texans would achieve a victory at San Jacinto. To say life in those days was difficult is an understatement. Physical hardships were the only things that were plentiful. But the family survived, often with many children. One ancestor enlisted to serve in the Confederate States of America. Some drove Longhorn cattle up the Chisholm Trail from South Texas to Kansas. The trip took half a year. Real cowboys. Out of this cloud of dust and tough living come young George Dave Wright and Viola Mae Hickey. Together, they have almost 20 siblings. Dave and May are wed in 1921. He had been a doughboy in Europe in World War I, wounded and missing in action. She had never been more than a few hundred miles from Yoakum, Texas. Together, they put in time at an oil camp in Mexico to earn a nest egg to buy land and began ranching and a dairy. Here is where we meet Bernadine, the bathing beauty, on the steps of her parents' apartment in San Antonio, Texas. It is summer 1924, and she is a couple of months old. A couple of showgirls, older sister Marjorie at two years, and Bernadine a year younger on a relative's car in Yoakum, Texas. They are the oldest grandchildren. The year is 1925. The same year, Margie and Bernie arrive at the farmhouse that is shared with their father's brother's family for 12 years. A couple of years later, Bernie and Margie are joined by younger sister, Dorothy June. The setting is their grandmother's yard. It's 1930, and a formal studio portrait is made of the young Wright sisters. Rita May has arrived on the scene, and Mother made the dresses. Margie, Bernie, and Rita in normal attire. Overalls, barefooted, and long-sleeved. School days at Buena Vista School. The first grade teacher is Miss Margaret Barnett. Bernadine and Marjorie in Martha Washington costumes for a school play at Buena Vista. Mother May made the costumes. It is April in 1932. Bernie, Margie, and Dorothy June receive First Holy Communion at St. Leo's Church. Dorothy June is just five years old, but knows her catechism well. Dorothy June died of pneumonia less than a year later and was buried in her same white communion dress. Mother and kids in 1935 at the original farmhouse. 
Dave and May Wright work hard to make a living off the land. It is not all that easy during the 1930s. The economics of the Great Depression affect everyone. Bernadine feels a great affinity and admiration for her father, a gentle man. Half a century later, May would remember he brought her the first wildflowers he encountered each spring in the pastures. Two seventh graders, Marjorie and Bernadine, study with beloved teacher Howard Ashley. Bernadine's best girlfriend, Dolly John, in the yard at the farm. Curls from the first permanent given by Aunt Virgie. Another friend with Bernadine and Marjorie, Margie Gerhardt. Miss Gerhardt introduced the sisters to the young people of St. Cecilia's Parish where they became involved in many activities, including bowling. It's 1938, and Bernadine and Marjorie are dressed for their first formal dating with Irwin and A.J. Ripple for the Central Catholic Prom. The photo was taken in the living room in the new stone farmhouse on the back 150 acres. National Honor Society members as juniors, the sisters graduated from Harlandale High School in 1940. Bernadine is just 16 years old. Senior Day, Aileen Lane, Marjorie, Jean Coleman, Eloise Taylor, Bernadine, Isabel Loveless, and Dolly John. The five middle girls are dressed as the Dion Quince. Bernadine in a mystery setting. Great shoes. In 1941, we see Cubby Manning, soon to be Marjorie's life mate, and John Enderley. Bernadine double dates with her sister. It's John's car. We've come to 1942. For $15 a week, the working girls are able to purchase full-length fur coats from Frost of San Antonio. They have attended Drogan's Business College. The first employment is at Union State Bank in South San Antonio. Bernadine is a working girl for six years. Fun in the Sun. A 1946 fishing trip to Port Aransas. Dad Wright, the youngest child David, Margie and Cubby, Bernadine and Dad Manning. Bernie catches some rays and some looks on the beach in this swimsuit. June 1946, the parents' 25th wedding anniversary. The shot is taken at El Carmen Church. Dad Wright had helped to restore the church. The congregation was comprised mostly of Hispanics. The Dave Wrights are consistent Catholics, deeply devoted. Margie and Cubby Manning moved to College Station, Texas in 1946 after World War II. Bernadine is introduced to a former high school friend of Cubby's named Milton Allen. Both Cubby and Milton are enrolled at the Agricultural and Mechanical College in the middle of nowhere. Tuition was courtesy of the GI Bill. Milton and Bernadine had a blind date, or perhaps their first date, for a Texas A&M, Texas University football game on Thanksgiving in 1947. Milton had come from a career army family. He had lived as a child in the Philippines and on the East Coast. 
In World War II, he served in the Air Force in the air campaign against Germany. He was based in England during the conflict. Bernadine and Milton were married less than a year later on September 4, 1948. The wedding took place in St. Joseph's Church. The Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament Academy played and sang the wedding music. wedding trip to Monterey, Mexico, as a local society page reported, the couple will reside at College Station. Milton would be finishing his senior year of studies there. But life has a way of both big and little surprises. The following May, during study for his finals, Bernadine and Milton take a fast track trip to San Antonio to birth their firstborn, Jimmy. As Bernadine later put it, James Milton Allen seemed anxious to get into this world, arriving a month before expected. Newlyweds, new parents, and looking for a job the same time many World War II vets were, the family ended up in Houston, Texas. Milton worked for the Internal Revenue Service. In September 1950, two years to the day of marriage, Diane Elizabeth Allen is born. Bernadine has her hands full with a baby and a very active toddler. Jimmy and Diane are Dave and May's first grandchildren and receive a bit of extra attention from the aunts and uncles. The family rented for several years before buying a house in Houston. About 1954, Milton takes a job north and west from Houston in Hearn, Texas. In the next year, a second son is born, Gary Wright Aylin. He has a tough time at birth, but soon is happy and healthy. Gary smiles often. And so family life for the Aylins unfolds in its own way. It is the 1950s. Ike Eisenhower is in the presidential office and the newly emerging mass medium of television is in black and white. Living is somewhat predictable in the little Texas town. There is no local radio station, only a weekly newspaper. In March 1959, George Dave Wright passes on. He leaves after spending a full Easter Sunday with his family. May lives another 30 years as a widow. It is the early 1960s, and the two oldest kids will come into the teen years. Really hot technology is a portable transistor radio which pulls in 
an AM radio station from beyond Robertson County. Bernadine serves as room mother, joins the garden club, helps with the Cub Scouts, and is a member of the Author Society at St. Mary's Church. Milton works with the Scouts and later becomes a member of the local school board. The late 1960s are a time of transition for the Aylen kids. Gary becomes a teenager, Jimmy heads for the seminary, and Diane enters college. Television is now in color, and in Hearn you can receive two channels. It is the 1970s when Bernadine sees the greatest change in the family, although the nest is empty. The number of people she loves and cooks for doubles by the end of the decade. Diane meets and marries Bob Wallace. Jimmy bids farewell to the monastery and takes up a life with Lynn and Damon. Along come Beth Wallace, Jamie Allen, Joshua Wallace. The 1980s arrive, grandchildren are growing, and Gary meets, woos, and marries Jenny Long. The family gets together frequently, and Bernadine cooks even more. moves to Bryan, Texas. Bernadine and Milton are blessed to have Margie and Cubby Manning 25 miles away in College Station to share wider family celebrations and take comfort together against all the change and shenanigans of the younger generation. In the last decade of the century, the 1990s, the family moves apart geographically but still gets together on occasion to renew the bond. Bernadine and Milton commemorate 50 years of marriage together. It is both a long and short time from 1948. In 1999, Bernadine celebrates her 75th birthday. The baby in the bucket is changed, but somehow still the same. Generations have come and gone. Places and faces roll by. Perhaps the only thing we can really take with us are the relationships we have lived through and the memories of those we have loved and those who have loved us. As the great poet has said, these our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-kept towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, 
all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. in 24 with clear blue eyes and so much more a texas bell from san antone the boys could not leave her alone one turkey day this ag came calling and for his heart she went a fallen a wedding march and three kids later for 50 years a loving mater <laughs> With an unselfish heart and gentle hand. Her loving ways are always grand. The mother hen of quite a brood. Became a master cook of southern food. A lady grand in all respects. Still turning heads of the opposite sex. While jogging at the local track. With Hook or Leon or sometimes Jack. We punctuate this special time with gifts and toast and birthday rhymes. Yes, we celebrate our love for you and pray all your wishes may come true. Happy birthday, dear Mimi. Happy birthday to you. First, I want to say happy birthday. I wish I could be there with everybody, but unfortunately it's work before pleasure. When Mom asked me to make this tape about Mimi, I immediately thought of two characteristics. The first is her kindness. I think that in all the years I've known Mimi, I don't ever remember her saying anything malicious to or about anyone. And uh, maybe that's just because I haven't known her long enough, but I doubt it because the second thing I thought of was her religious devotion. I think that she's been an inspiration to myself and everyone around her to be a better person. And uh, I want to thank her for being such a positive influence on my life and tell her that she'll always have a special place in my heart. Thank you, Mimi. I love you very much. Happy birthday. Mary Bernadine Wright Aylin. When I think of my grandmother, I envision an individual who embodies the spirit of womanhood, faithful and devoted in her covenant to God, her church, her family, and to herself. She goes by many names, among them wife, mother, sister, child, grandmother, caregiver, friend, and the list goes on. Gifted as a seamstress, chef, and gardener, one who has managed to, among other things, dedicate herself in the name of honesty, amiability, charity, hospitality, benevolence, practicality, frugality, humility, and generosity. One of two who have lent an active hand and have in some way shaped all of our lives. Happy birthday, Mimi. You're very special to all of us. Well, happy 75th birthday, Mimi. And thanks for everything. You've basically been there from the get-go for me, 23 plus years. And I can truly say I'm a better person for having known you. Thanks for being the matriarch of our great clan. And thanks especially for raising my mom the right way so that she could raise me the right way. I think of you as a picture of dignity and grace and a model of faith for me in my Catholic life. Thanks for everything, and I wish I was up there in Salt Lake. But I'll see you when you get back to Texas.
No sir. Mimi, this is Damon. I wanted to wish you a happy birthday, happy 75th. I'm very proud for you to be my grandmother. Some of the things that make me so proud are one, that you're so compassionate and so fair and so concerned with goodwill towards others and other people's feelings. I learned that from you at an early age. You're also very devoted. I've never had anyone um, put so much effort into being a true grandmother like you have. You're the only person I'll ever call that. Um, and also, um, not just beyond your qualities as a person, I wanted to dwell on some memories. I remember going on a lot of road trips with you as a kid. I remember you teaching me the definition of a mirage and that it's very good to learn two things a day, every day of your life. That has stuck with me to this day. I also remember you taking me to Austin for my first time and describing to me how you like to watch news because you very much wanted to know what was going on in the world. I think that has stuck to me this day. Happy birthday again. I love you very much and I'm very proud of you. Two of the experiences I find most distasteful are seeing pictures of myself or hearing my voice on tape. I suppose its Freudian analysis would be very didactic. It is disconcerting to me somehow that in spite of all my training, I always seem to sound like I was dragged out of the bayou somewhere. Non-regional speech is not much of an option. Sometimes I think, well, perhaps I'll choose a different accent, something a bit high-born or, or British maybe, and then again I think perhaps I won't. It's just not me. I think you understand how significant it is, but I don't know if you understand how honored I feel to contribute pictures of myself and a recording of my voice to help celebrate this wonderful occasion. About a quarter of a century ago, I became part of the Aylin family. I can truthfully say that you have not only functioned more as a mother to me than any other person has, but now you have done it for a longer period of time than either of my biological parents did. You have never made me feel that you were being judgmental about the way I look or what I sound like or anything else about me, really. And so I offer you many happy returns. Maria was right. Whenever God closes a door, he always opens a window. Happy birthday, and thanks for letting me in to share it all. Lynn. Happy birthday, Bernie. It has been nearly 30 years since I came into your life as a skinny, long-haired kid with nothing but potential. You must have had great faith in your only daughter's judgment or spent a lot of time in prayer those days. Through the years, I've learned to appreciate your positive, upbeat attitude, strong faith, and dedication to your family and friends. I'm also crazy about your cooking and appreciate the skill passed on to your daughter. I hope you have a wonderful